you some of my, use of my, you, they, they wouldn't be able to hear you. Good morning, corporate finance. Good morning, everyone. I'm Phil Hill. This is Becca. We're running for student government co-president. And we just wanted to take a quick minute to introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit of what, we're, what we stand for. So first and foremost, we just want to start by taking a quick poll. How many of you have found yourself in the position of being between classes, really having to go to the bathroom, and finding that it's closed for cleaning, and then have to run to another store? That's yeah. a problem. Um, how many of you have found that since launch that maybe you're a little disconnected with the administration and don't really have an idea of what's going on in the school beyond just your day in your life? Right, I agree. And finally, how many of you are trying to save a little bit of money by cooking food at home, but come here and often find there's no way to either store it or heat it up? So that's why we're here. We're here to help fix that. We're running for student government co-presidents because we care about the Stern community. For us, community means transparency, inclusion, and a high quality of life. You may have engaged with us this year through our, uh, our different roles on campus. Uh, so Hill is a, the male ally to SWIB Woo! and an ally to ABBA. <laughs> um, we're also members of EMSA and UPSA. Um, and we will bring the same level of commitment and passion to service to our roles as SGOV co-presidents as we have to our roles this year. If you'd like to learn more about our platform, there's a town hall today at 4.30 in room 260. Come learn more, and no matter what, make sure to vote between 5.30 today and midnight tomorrow. Remember, that's Rebecca and Sohail for SGOV co-presidents. Thank you. Where is everybody? Already people are dropping off like flies. <laughs> and let me start with the two questions again. Everybody's in a group now, right? OK. How many of you have not picked a company yet? I'll keep doing this till there are no hands up. And so at some point in time, even if you haven't picked a company, you'll probably not bring your hand up. Just pick a company, as I said, and start moving. Okay? So at this stage, here's where we are in the class. We're still kind of in this place where we're talking about, we haven't talked about numbers, no cost of capital, no betas. We're still talking about where the power in a company, what's the end game for a company? And the reason I spend so much time on it is if we don't agree on the end game, we're not going to agree on any of the intermediate steps as well. So let me, let me go back to where we ended the last session. We were talking about how, you know, if you look at traditional corporate, utopian corporate finance, everything starts to break down. Stockholders have little power over managers, so what do managers do? What's in their best interest? Lenders lend money to a firm. They don't protect themselves. They get Nabisco. You know, managers hold back information to markets. They sometimes lie to markets. And markets, in response, are not always cool and rational. There is some evidence that they do crazy things. In fact, um, in corporate finance, in finance in general, we have this bad habit of assuming rational markets because it makes our life easier. And whenever people get too caught up in the rational market assumption, I apply what's called the Elvis Presley test. You heard of this test? Hey, here's the first part of the test. How many of you think Elvis is still alive? Okay. Well, maybe you do, in which case your MBA might be retracted. So, uh, <laughs> well, you're getting to a point where you think he has to be dead. He must be so old. But somebody's saying, I, I read it, that he's in Michigan. He's grown a beard. His next album is coming out on iTunes next month. Second part of the test, you can relax. It has nothing to do with you. Do you read USA Today? It's a McDonald's version of a newspaper. Because okay. you can read all the news in about 20 minutes. But every day in USA Today, they have a poll. And they must run out of questions to ask because that's 260 days. They don't print on weekends, in case you're wondering. So they must you know, they ask questions like, do you like lettuce on your burger? 67% of Americans said yes. 26% said no. And 7% said I don't know. Have you ever wondered, no matter what the poll is, there is this floating 7% that don't know? <laughs> Americans were asked, what's your name? 93% of Americans said, I know. 7% said, I don't know. Incredibly paranoid French saying, don't ask me any questions, because my answer might be held against me. So this was about 25 years ago, on the 15th anniversary of Elvis's death. 
He asks this question, do you think Elvis Presley is still alive? 71% of Americans said no, thank God for small blessings. 22% said yes, and 7% of course said, I don't know. So let's set that 7% aside as paranoid and rational. The two are not mutually exclusive. Maybe it's the rest of us who should be watching what we're doing. But think about it, 22% of Americans thought Elvis was still alive. The population of the US is about 300 million. 22% of 300 million is 66 million Americans walking around thinking, Elvis is still alive. That's the vision that comes into my mind. Whenever somebody gets caught up in rational investors who take information and process it and project out cash flows the next 10 years and discount it back at the right risk-adjusted discount rate, my reaction is right. There are 66 million people walking around thinking Elvis. And this was before our minds were fried with all the reality TV we watch. I, I hate to think the answers to questions you'd get today if you ask them. So what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of crazy people out there doing crazy things. Trying to explain what markets do can drive you crazy. Because this is one thing about CNBC every, every day as the market is in, they call in experts to try to explain. It is one of the most pointless exercises. They have no idea, but they've got to make up crap as they go along. The reality is markets move in the short term for reasons that you can't fathom. And you've got to keep that in mind as you start. As we go through corporate finance, we're going to say, if you do this, this, and this, your value will increase as a company. And if you try this in a real company, and you say your value will increase, you know what the managers are going to ask you. If I do this, will my stock price go up as well? You know what the answer should be? There are 66 million people walking around thinking Elvis is still alive. I cannot predict what the stock price will do. And this is where I think we have to think about you know, sometimes you can do the right thing as a company and your value can go up and the price can go down. Sometimes you can do terrible things as a company and your value can go down and the price can go up. So we have to accept that as part of the game. You, you're not going to fix it. You're saying one of these days we'll get rational. No, we're human. We'll never get rational. We get better data. It doesn't help. So markets do crazy things. And finally, we talked about social costs. In theory, we'd like companies to be socially responsible, do the right thing. We want to incorporate that into decision making, I understand. So when you make decisions, you want to make decisions that are not just in your best financial interest, but are good for society. But then the next step becomes more difficult because if you think about sitting around a table trying to decide on a project, and you decide to bring in social costs and benefits, we talked about the potential problems. So first is, that social costs and benefits are in the eyes of the beholder. Yesterday I sent you three rankings of companies on a social responsibility scale. None of them match up. The AFL-CIO actually ranks companies based on how well they treat their workers. The ranking looks very different than what Greenpeace gets as a ranking for companies because their focus is on environmental issues. Each social group has its own strong force, and that's where they go. I'm not saying any of them is right or wrong. I'm just saying social costs and benefits are very difficult to kind of get resolution on because each of us has our own strong views on something or the other that we think should be weighted the most. But let's face it. The push for companies to be socially responsible is very strong. Every company wants to be socially responsible, and my problem is they don't want to put their money where their mouth is. Because let's fa if you want to be socially responsible, you've got to be willing to give up something. You know, I'll, I'll give you the analogy that's happening on campuses across the country. There's this push to take universities with endowments. NYU doesn't have an endowment, so basically it's like nothing. But take a university like Yale or Harvard with 30 or 35 billion endowments and to get college endowments to invest in a socially responsible way. It's good, right? But you'd be surprised how many calls I get from endowment chairs saying, can you come in and convince our board that being socially responsible will actually increase our returns? <laughs> and I said, how can I do that? Mathematically, it's impossible, and here's why. Remember in mathematics, if you do an optimization problem, 
So think about the, an unconstrained mathematical problem. I ask you to go optimize something, and you optimize it, you come up with an answer. Then I put constraints on you and I ask you to optimize the same. You're going to get a, your, your solution at best can be the same as you had, but you can never do better. So the bottom line is, if you want to invest in a socially responsible way, accept the fact that you're now more constrained than you used to be. Say, I'm OK getting a 20 basis point lower return, because I feel better not investing in fossil fuel companies. But I think that's what we need to accept, is we want companies to be socially responsible. It's going to cost some money, and I'm going to put you through a very simplistic test to kind of illustrate this process. We're talking about Disney. There was a time when Disney had lots and lots of stores. They don't have that many anymore. I think there's one on, uh, you know, they're like, a, uh, there used to be about 600 Disney stores around the world. It's now down to the dozens, maybe. So Disney decides it's going to be, do the right thing. So they pick an inner city. You pick the inner city. It could be Oakland. It could be Newark. They decide to open a Disney store, but I'm not going to give you any escape hatches here. This Disney store is going to lose money. You can't use it for public relations and advertising and use that as your, because then you're not do, being socially responsible, you're just doing advertising. So essentially, you're going to open the store knowing fully well that every year that it's open, you're going to lose about a million dollars. But you're going to create you know, some revitalization of the inner city, create jobs where there are no jobs. This is a socially responsible thing to do, right? Let's say you are the manager who has to make this decision? Would you open? The, how many of you would open the store? Just one. In fact, I would ask this question to Disney's top managers, and when they and I'll guarantee that, that most of them will do the same thing that you did. They said, "That's I wouldn't do that." And then I'm going to show them their own annual report and read to them the sections of their annual report where they tell me how socially responsible they are. You want to be socially responsible? It's going to cost you money. Nothing wrong with that because you are, in fact, creating benefits for society. But let's say you do open the store, and it's going to cost you a million dollars. Here's my second question. Would you be willing to go in front of your stockholders and tell them what you've done? In other words, if you're going to spend money to be socially responsible, are you going to be transparent about how much money you're spending? Why? Because it's not your money. If this is a private business and you own the private business, you want to give away half your profits to, you know, to provide scholarships for, you know, for students who don't have money, all the more power to you. It's your money. I will not stop you. But if you're the CEO of a company, don't you dare give away other people's money and not tell them, because that's not right. And that, to me, is where publicly traded companies run into issues. Because it's easy to be charitable with other people's money. You can give to the Met, you can give to whoever you want, but you're giving other people's money. So if we're going to open this door, let's open the door. Let's let companies reveal, and they don't have to take everything they do and break it down in detail, say this is how much we're going to set aside to be socially responsible. Be transparent about this with your shareholders. You don't even have to give them more. At least let them see what you're spending. And sometimes they're not going to like it, in which case you should stop. Remember I said to be charitable, you first have to be financially healthy. If you're doing well for your stockholders, guess what? They're incredibly charitable. You make $50 billion, and you want to set aside 100 million. I feel pretty good. Go ahead, and go ahead and do that. But if your stock price is down 50%, don't you even dare get up there and say, I'm going to be charitable with you. You are already charitable with their money <laughs> by taking bad projects and wiping out half their equity value. So I think if we want to make social responsibility real, we've got to start to be ex explicit about what. Because right now, here's what companies do. They spend money on the sly. They do it on managers' pet causes. And they say, look, we have to be socially responsible. That's why we're doing it. That's not right. If you're going to be socially responsible, I think we need to be explicit. And I have no problem with you spending tens of millions of dollars if you're doing well for me. And you are transparent about what you do.
No, but tax deduction can't make a negative, it'll make it less negative. Giving away 100 million might give me a tax deduction, but it's not going to make it a positive net present value investment. It'll just make it 60 million. I think this is actually a better social investment than you giving money to the Met. It's still effectively the same thing, right? I still, do I get to deduct the 100 million losses in the project when I do my taxes? Absolutely. Any time I lose money on a project, so this will be a tax deductible charitable contribution if you want to call it that. But my point is, if we, if we, if you talk to CEOs, they say, but if I told the shareholders how much money I'm spending being socially conscious, they will not let me spend it. You got to trust people to make the judgment if it's their money. And remember. The fact that you're not charitable with the money doesn't mean that they can't be charitable. Because remember, this is not a zero-one proposition. If you're not, let's say you take that money, you decide to be charitable with, and pay it out as dividends. That money goes into people's pockets. They, so this notion that companies have to take on the responsibility of their stockholders' moral failings, I think is a, is a dangerous one, because where do we stop? So this is a debate that I think we're going to see play out with corporate social responsibility that we have to play through to fruition. Yeah? No, no, wait, wait. Did I say that? I said if you invest, be transparent about it so that I know what the investment is going into. Then you're all, oh, you're saying what if I... The same thing is the social cost issue, right? So let's assume that some companies restrain themselves because of that. We're going to talk about constraints, and I'm going to argue that maximizing value without constraints is an extremely dangerous place to be. I'm going to argue for constraints, and one of the constraints is a good citizen constraint, which is you do not want to do things that create large enough costs, but I'm going to do this in a way where the consequences ultimately have to be financial for you. Because if those consequences don't exist, here's what's going to happen. Good companies are going to constrain themselves, right? They're going to hold back. But guess who's not holding back? There are other bad players in the game who are going to say, look, there are no laws against doing this. So you need this process to play through financially. Otherwise, what you're going to get are a subset of companies that will keep to the rules and not create costs. But another subset of companies will go out and do crazy things. And the debate then has to be, how do we prevent that process from unfolding? And that unfortunately means you've got to feel it in your pocketbook. So we'll talk about some of the things that you get as a blowback when you do that, when you take decisions that are financially viable but are, but are also creating these social costs. Okay. So as you pick up your annual report, right after you read about your board of directors, I want you to go and see how much of your company's annual report is spent, talking about how socially responsible they are. It's amazing. Half the annual report is pictures of managers doing amazing things and employees doing amazing things for society. And the question is, is this just public relations? Is this an ad campaign? Or is this real social responsibility? Because real social responsibility will take the form of companies spending money and being open with their shareholders saying, this is why we're spending the money. Yes. Well, it's not that it's not real, but then don't talk social responsibility. They say it's an ad campaign. I'm doing this because it makes, my, makes me look good, right? I mean, let's so, beat the person. But, but then we don't need any of this stuff. There is no need for a corporate social risk. If, in fact, companies, when they do good, automatically got you know, more people buying their stuff, if it was an ad campaign, none of these classes, in fact, I don't want to step on toes, but you don't need a CSR class anymore because then if you do the right thing, it turns out that you get more people buy your stuff. Unfortunately, that link between you doing ads on how socially responsible you are and customers buying your products is far weaker in some businesses than others. So I have no problem with people doing that. But then this becomes a charade. Corporate social responsibility is really not about corporate social responsibility. It's just another PR campaign, another advertising campaign. And that's really not... But I'm saying if it pays off, if that's all you need to pay off, then we don't need a social responsibility constraint. Do you see what I'm saying? So 
this is a constraint only when you have problems, like when companies do what's financially viable, they can create social costs and they can't be traced to them. You're saying if you create social benefits, you can get a benefit right away, then it's no longer by definition a social benefit. It's an economic benefit. The definition of social costs and social benefits is you're doing good and you get nothing in return. You're doing bad and nothing bad happens to you. Then we have a problem. And that's the kind of problem that we wrestle with when we talk about how do we incorporate social responsibility into decision making. So I've shredded the utopian objective function of corporate finance, right? Maximizing stock prices is a horrifically bad objective if managers can put their self-interest ahead and lenders can get ripped off and markets can be lied to and you can create lots of social costs. So let's summarize exactly what we are. At this point, it looks like maximizing stock prices is dead in the water. Every single link, I've assumed, is broken down. So, and if you think about why it breaks down, there's managerial self-interest, there are unprotected lenders, inefficient markets. So this is the world we live in. So let's talk about what to do instead. I'm going to give you three different alternatives to unconstrained maximizing stock prices. I have my, my favorite, but I'm going to try to keep my favorite out of the picture until I've been as open as I can about the three choices. The first is maybe we can pick a different corporate governance mechanism. In the world that I've just described, who's responsible for keeping managers in line? It's you and I as stockholders, right? Maybe we're unequipped for this. Maybe stockholders don't know enough, they don't care enough. Maybe we need a different corporate governance mechanism. If that sounds abstract, I'll give you a couple of examples of alternative corporate governance mechanisms. And maybe you'll hang your hat on one of those. The second is, maybe the problem is the objective we picked, maximizing stock prices. Maybe if I maximize revenue growth, or maximize market share, this wouldn't happen. So we'll look at alternative objectives. And the third is, maybe, maybe we can maximize stock prices, but put in constraints on being a good social citizen, making sure that you don't rip off the bondholders. I told you I have a bias, I'll reveal my bias, because you're going to see it very quickly. Everything I know in corporate finance is built around maximizing value. So if you pick one of the other two alternatives, we have to redo the whole class, <laughs> and I don't have the time to develop new theory for it. So I'm going to try to nudge you towards a third objective, but I'll also tell you that about 20, 30 percent of you, and that might be a low number, are not going to be convinced. And the rest of this class, you're going to be struggling as we go through individual topics with this underlying issue. Because as I said, if we don't agree on the end game, then we're going to disagree on how to get there. So let's start with an alternative corporate governance system. In 1945, Germany and Japan as economies were in complete shambles. So after the Second World War, there's nothing left. And in true economic miracles, the two countries built themselves back up to becoming the second and the third largest economies in the world by the mid-1980s. And they each adopted governance systems that were very different from the US system, the stockholder-based system. It started with Japan. Japan, you had karutsus. Karutsus, karutsus are companies that hold stock in each other, cross-holding groups. A hundred companies bound together by cross-holders. You're saying, how does that help? Here's the way corporate governance worked in Japan. If you had one of these companies run by somebody who was a bad manager, the remaining 99 managers got together and replaced the manager of the 100th company. Stockholders had nothing to do with it. Managers took care of their own bad apples. Germany had a similar system, but a bank was always in the middle. So Daimler was the, I'm sorry, Deutsche was the largest single stockholder in Daimler, which was the largest single stockholder in Alliance, which was the largest single stockholder in Deutsche. So they basically were supposed to keep an eye on each other, making sure none of them stepped off the reservation. You see what these systems share in common? They're elitist systems. Basically, the presumption is 
stock orders are the unwashed masses. They went to the wrong schools. They probably don't know as much as the managers who went to the best schools who are, know more about business. Let the experts take care of the problem. In fact, in Japan, the Ministry of Finance was revered in the 1980s. And the Ministry of Finance was just technocrats who basically made decisions on where the economy should go, what company. So, and if you think about the Chinese economy and the growth it's had, it is not a stock order driven model, definitely. It's a Beijing driven model. I mean, the, what the government gives, it can take away, as Tencent has found out very quickly. So these are top-down systems, elitist systems. And they worked really well. Until the mid-80s, you, so you saw how Germany and Japan evolved. In fact, by the mid-80s, J Japan in particular had done so well that there were people in business schools in the US who were arguing that what was wrong with the US was in, what, it wasn't more like Japan. Sounds almost laughable now, given where Japan's been stuck. But in the 1980s, it looked amazing. 7, 8% growth a year. In fact, Michael Porter, corporate strategy guru, argued that maybe in the US we need to set up our own currencies. So stockholders are too short term. They didn't realize what was good for them. And 1988, that's, that's essentially the thesis he came out with. And then in the 1990s, you saw the downside of both the Japanese and the German systems. And this is actually a common theme any time you have expert-run systems. The problem with elitists is elitists. They think they know what they're doing. And when they make a mistake, they hate to admit mistakes. And this has been true through time, right? It's been true in the military. It's been true in business. If you have experts making decisions, they might make some really great decisions. But if those decisions go bad, they hate to admit to them. So what do they do? They cover up, and they hope the mistake goes away. So let me go back to 1992. In 1992, US banks and Japanese banks both had big real estate loan problems. They'd made loans on real estate that, where they'd overreach. In 1992, US banks were forced by the market to kind of accept the problems. So Citibank, I think, lost 35% of its market cap because of those bad loans. They had to write off the loans, be punished by markets, but they cleaned up their balance sheets and they moved on to the next problems 15 years later. But that was a different story. The Japanese banks said, what real estate problem? They surrounded the wagons, let as little information out as possible, and hoped the problem would go away. 26 years later, Japan is still paying the price for that unwillingness to deal with the problem. So here's what works. Here's what happens. When you have 100 companies, one manager is doing the wrong thing. You're right. The remaining 99 will get together and replace the one guy. But let's suppose you have a different scenario. We have 100 companies, and 99 have made bad real estate loans, and one has it. Who's going to replace whom? Is the one guy who did the right thing going to replace the other 99? Not a chance. The other 99 are going to get together and say, what's wrong with you? You're not a team player. You're fired. It's a system that, in a sense, where if you have systematic mistakes, those systematic mistakes take a lot longer to clean up. It's always been the problem with top-down systems. Yeah. Well, in a sense, it preserves the status quo, right? And if the status quo is good, it works. But we live in a world of disruption. So if you have a status quo protecting system in a world of disruption, it's going to be much more difficult to adapt. So we can make, I, I can see the argument for employees being on the board. After all, they have often more to lose if the company goes down. But in many European countries, you also have you know, two boards. One is an executive board, the other is a management board, and the corporate governance is splintered all over. So I think the intentions are good. But in a world of change, preserving the status quo might not be the right solution. So I think that is the cost. Every system has a cost. With elitist systems, the benefit is 
I mean, change happens quickly. You don't get hostile takeovers. You don't get all that noise that comes out of that process. But you also have this cost of you have systematic problems. And this happened in Japan. It happened in Korea with chai bowls, very similar to karatsu's. In the late 90s, every Korean company borrowed too much. But nobody thought it was a problem because everybody else was doing it. Okay. So that's, I think, the cost you pay. And if you're willing to accept the cost, you know, I think that, that it's perfectly OK to pick a different corporate governance system. Yes? I'll tell you, that we, next week we're going to talk about diversification. You know what ESOPs are, where employee by, employees buy stock option, or are given stock options and stock in the company. And there's a plus to it, right, which is you're making employees think like stockholders. What's the minus? If you're an employee, where's the bulk of your portfolio invested? It's in human capital. In which company? Whichever company you're working in. Now, what am I making you do? Take the rest of your savings and invest it into the same company. If that company goes down the drain, not only are you going to lose your job, you're also going to. So there is an argument that while there's an incentive that this might be good to reduce you know, the misalignment of incentives, the cost is you're creating people who are overinvested in individual companies. And in a world of change, that's going to be a problem as well. So nothing comes without a cost. I'm not saying any of these you're going to rule out, but I'm saying you've got to weigh the costs and the benefits. Right now, if you look at the Chinese system, what's the consensus view? The benefits have outweighed the cost. Look how well it's done. But you know when systems come under, get tested? It's not when times are good, it's when times are bad. When you're growing 10% a year, who knows? It's like being a, a, a coach of a team that's winning all the time. Nobody realizes you're an ass. <laughs> and nobody likes you because you're winning. You're Bill Belichick. But if Bill Belichick had a 4 and 12 season, all of a sudden you're going to see flaws in him that you never saw before. The test for the Chinese system is coming. It's coming because growth is going to slow down. You know why? It's a math problem. When you're the 10th largest economy in the world, you can grow 10% a year. Maybe when you're the 5th largest, you can grow 8% a year. When you're the 2nd largest economy in the world, and the world is growing at about 2 to 3%, the math problem is going to kick in. There is no way you can grow 10% a year without devastating the rest of the world. Growth is going to come down, and that's when we're going to see whether the Chinese governance system is going to be flexible enough to deal with what needs to be done. So corporate governance system, if you can want to go with another one, go for it, but make sure you think through the consequences. Let's talk about a different objective. So the objective can be maximize growth, maximize number of users. MoviePass did that really well, right? <laughs> you know, you, we live in a user world where, hey, you have a lot of users. So you can think about maximizing users, maximizing revenues, maximizing growth, maximizing earnings. I could give you 15 other objectives. You're saying one of those must be better, right? To point uh, out, to, to look at the, what the problem is. With, I call these intermediate objectives. Let me explain why. Market share. Would you like to have a higher market share as a company? Yeah, right. But what if to get the higher market share, you have to sell below cost? Would you want 100? I'll give you 100% market share of this market if, you can, if you're willing to sell below cost. You think that's absurd. I'd notice it. I'll give you a story. The early 1980s, 1981, a guy called Robert Crandall became CEO of American Airlines. And I remember his first press conference. In his first press conference, he announced that he was going to make American the number one domestic US airline over the next decade. By 1989, it succeeded. American was the number one domestic US airline if you defined it as you know, number of passengers flown. But there were only two airlines in 1989 making money, and neither of them was called American. One was Alaska Air, because I guess nobody else wanted to fly to Fairbanks. The other was the still nascent Southwest Air. And you know what they flew? They flew Dallas to Houston back again, back to, you know. Not the most glamorous route, but we're making a lot of money. It was the exact opposite of a market share argument. You know, for the longest time, Southwest did not have a coast-to-coast -coast flight. Why? Because they said, we can't make money. We're not flying it. 
here's the problem with picking an intermediate objective. If that objective matches up with higher, so if you can, by increasing market share, increase your pricing power, just don't let the antitrust guys know that that's what's happened, because that could open you up for some trouble. That pricing power could give you higher margins, higher earnings, but the end game is still that you're going to make yourself a more valuable company. You're saying, I know that. The problem is once you pick an objective, it starts to rule decision making within the company. Remember those Wells, that Wells Fargo scandal from a couple of years ago? If you think about why it happened, you know, managers were being given commissions based on the number of accounts they opened. So guess what they said? Let's go open accounts, fake accounts, real accounts, small accounts, big accounts, who cares? They're rewarding me based on the number of accounts. I'm going to go and do that. If you pick an objective, I can almost guarantee you that it will percolate through. And that guy is not thinking about, will this maximize earnings and value for Wells Fargo? He couldn't care less. When you pick an intermediate objective, you better think through the consequences and make sure that you fix those problems. Otherwise, the objective will rule. Banks have their own version of this, right? It's called the deal table. Have you ever been in a bank where they show you the deal table? Look, we're at the top of the deal table. We're number one. That's a market share argument. How do you get to the top of the deal table? You do really big deals. Not really good deals, but really big deals. So if you pick an intermediate objective, watch out. And watch out if you have a consultant who's going to come in and give you advice on what to do in the future, because every consultant has their own proprietary metric that they've created that they say is better than maximizing value. In the 1990s, there was this output called Stern Stewart, that was a New York-based consulting firm that said, hey, all you need to do is not this value stuff, but this proprietary variable metric we've called EVA, economic value added. As we'll see in this class, there's nothing proprietary or new about EVA. It's as old as time. But they put an EVA in a little circle and an R next to it, and they said, you need us to come and calculate it for you. This is how you keep this as a sustainable business. CFROI, another, another term that was created. Basically what consultants are saying, value is too complicated, we'll give you something else, but it's still an intermediate objective. So if you're going to pick another objective, think through, be cynical. Ask yourself what's the worst case scenario that could unfold with this objective, and over time it will. So if I ask you to maximize earnings, what are you going to do if you're a pharmaceutical company? You're going to cut R&D right away. Why? Because R&D is an operating expense. The minute you cut it, your earnings pop up. You say, look, I'm more profitable now. You're saying, that makes no sense. It makes complete sense if I'm going to give you a bonus based on profits this year. Every objective has consequences. There are no perfect objectives. So if you don't like maximizing value, I'm with you. But I'd like to see what you're going to maximize instead. And don't give me this crap about maximizing stakeholder wealth. <laughs> it's absurd. And here's why. You know, I have four kids. It's like going on vacation saying, my objective this vacation is to make sure everybody is happy. You know what's going to happen? None of us is going to be happy. I have to pick a singular objective. Who has to be happy? Oh, okay. I'll maximize my happiness, and I'll constrain the unhappiness of everybody else. But <laughs> Same thing applies for companies. When people say, I want to maximize stakeholder wealth, what are they saying? I want to maximize stockholder wealth, and by the way, as I'm doing that, I'm going to maximize my employee wages, and I'm going to maximize uh, societal benefits. You can't have it all. You've got to define what your objective is and what the constraints are. And if you want to make maximizing employee wages your objective, OK, fine. Then make stockholder wealth your constraint, right, where I have to deliver. So, but you need to define for yourself what your objective and what your constraints are. Which brings me to back to maximizing stock prices. I'll tell you my biggest sales pitch for why I think it still makes sense to maximize value and perhaps even focus on stock prices. It is the only self-correcting objective function. Basically what I mean is, whenever we talked about all those things that, 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 that represent overreaching, Stockholders have no power, managers do what's in their interest, lenders lend money, they don't protect themselves, companies lie to markets, markets do crazy things. Embedded in all of those dysfunctional actions is a blowback effect. And let me explain what I mean by that. 
If managers take advantage of stockholders, let's say you're a stockholder in a company and I'm a manager, I take advantage of you. Are you getting pissed off? You should be. I do it again. Are you getting more pissed off? Yes. There's a critical piss off point <laughs> where you finally decide to do something about it. It's like the, the movie Network where the guy of Peter Finch opens the, the, I'm mad as hell and I can't take it anymore. You hit that point. You say, what am I going to do? I own a thousand shares. There are people out there who are really good at sensing when people have gotten to that critical piss off point. We call them activist investors. The biggest skill set for an activist investor, Carl Icahn is not the deepest thinker on the face of the earth. He's a one trick pony. Here's what he seems to do. He goes to companies and says, you have too much cash, give me the cash. Have you noticed this? Pretty much every Carl Icahn pitches, you have too much cash, give me the cash. You see, how did the guy get as rich as he is? Because he is good at spotting companies where stockholders are really pissed off. And we'll talk about some of the things that activist investors then do to take advantage of the fact that you're so pissed off that you're no longer throwing the proxy in the trash can. You're willing to do something about it. So managers overreach, you get pushback. We talked about the Nabisco effect, right? Lenders lend money, they don't protect themselves, they get ripped off. Well, people learn, the bond market learned after the Nabisco fiasco, they learned that if you issue bonds without protection, so bond markets and lenders started, but too late to protect them on the Nabisco deal, but they learned enough that they protected themselves on the next round. We talked about companies lying to markets. Will the truth eventually come out? I might be naive, but the truth eventually does come out, and when the truth comes out, what happens to your stock price? It collapses, and worse, it stays down. You know why? Because you've lost all credibility. And finally, if you go around taking decisions that create lots of social costs on the side, you might get away with it in you know, one year or two, but you're getting a reputation as a company that even though you're doing things legally, is, going, is viewed as a corporate outlaw. It's what Facebook is fighting right now. Let's face it, all of the big tech companies now, I mean, three years ago, everybody thought they were godly companies. Now that everybody thinks they're devilish companies, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. But the reality is, if you get tarred as a, as a it starts to affect you, it is going to start to affect your finances as it is starting to affect Facebook in the form of fines and, you know. And so there are these ripple effects, more so in some businesses than others. But built into this model is a blowback mechanism. So let's start by looking at the stockholder backlash. It takes three forms. First is some institutional investors, most institutional investors I said were sheep. They sell, they move on, sell, move on. But you can't keep selling and moving on if everybody keeps doing the same thing. So finally, even a BlackRock wakes up and says, we cannot let these boards be these rubber stamps. We're going to push for institutional changes. So the first thing that happens is a subset of institutional investors get tired of getting beaten up and they wake up. But the problem with institutional investors, they're not mean enough, they're not aggressive enough to get the change. So that's where the activist investors kick in, the Carl Icahns, the Bill Ackmans of the world. And as I said, their power is detecting companies where people are really pissed off because they the, the, remember we talked about proxies, how most people don't return their proxies? Do, do you know what a proxy fight is? In a proxy fight, here's what happens. The day your proxy arrives, today it arrives online, you'll actually get a call from a service called, it's a proxy solicitation service. There are quite a few in New York. They're hired by the Bill Ackmans and the Carl Icans. And what they will ask you is, we know you just got your proxy for 1,000 votes, so you have 1,000 share, shares. We know you're, not plan you're planning not to go to the meeting. We know you are planning to just throw the shares away into the trash can. Would you consider turning your shares over to Carl Icahn? Now, you're not naive. You know Carl Icahn doesn't work in your best interest. But remember, you're so pissed off at the existing managers, you'd hand the shares over to anybody who asks you. A proxy solicitation fight is built on the premise that stockholders are mad enough at managers, they will turn their votes over. And finally, there's the ultimate threat. When people talk about hostile takeovers, at least if you watch Hollywood movies, 
The typical target company is a great, well-managed company run by some supremely moral person. I wish that were the truth. The typical target for company in a hostile acquisition is not a well-run, well-managed company that delivers good, good returns. The typical target company is badly managed, badly run, and has managed its own very little shares in the company. And I'm not just making this up. This, if you compare companies that are targets of hostile takeovers to their peer group, that's what you find. They earn a return in equity much lower than the typical company. Their managers own less shares. Their stock price has done worse. Hostile takeovers are the market's mechanism for disciplining companies that essentially have put their interests over stock or managers who have put their interests over stock order in this very extended period. So the typical target company, return on equity 5% lower, stock has done worse, has managers with little or no stock. So when people say, well, we need to stop hostile takeovers, what's the best way to stop hostile takeovers? Run your company well. That's it. It sounds simplistic, but that is the ultimate defense against hostile takeovers. Question. That's been true for a long, long time. It's, in fact, wor less worse now than it was in the 1990s. In the 1990s, the question was, management compensation has increasingly become equity-based. Okay? That started happening in the 1980s. And the initial argument was, sounded like a good thing. Managers act in their best interest. So how do you make them behave like shareholders? You make them shareholders. And in the early 90s, the, they started, you know, in fact, uh, the, 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 the origins of this are a little strange, but they started giving options to managers. Why? Because with options, the, re, the advantage of options instead of regular stock is accountants were so stupid that they actually treated options that were granted at the money as costless. So a company could give out millions of options, there no expense to show. So they gave millions of options to managers. Now they've shifted to restricted stock, but this is not a new phenomenon. It is, it is as, it's been going on for 40 years. But the question is, is that going to be enough to make them behave like shareholders? It depends on what you think about markets. If markets were rational, see, the, you know, then, of course, attaching your compensation to the stock price. But if you have 66 million people walking around thinking Elvis is still alive, you can see how CEOs can push up their stock price and collect their bonus and move on. So here's what companies have started adding. They've added this five-year waiting period where you've got to wait until the results start to show up. But, but you're almost, you know, you're running constantly to keep up with the next way you're going to try to get around whatever restrictions you put. But hostile takeovers, the classic, tip, the typical target company is not well-managed, well-run. It's badly managed and badly run. In fact, uh, there are countries which ban hostile takeovers. And you know who you protect? The worst among you. The worst companies are the ones that are most protected. So when you talk about the, co it is true. There are some hostile takeovers. You look at the target company and say, that shouldn't have happened. You ruin the company. But to use anecdotal evidence to kind of rule out takeover, it's like the same kind of evidence that you used to say, hey, buybacks should be stopped because some companies which shouldn't be doing buybacks are doing buybacks. That's going to be true for almost any corporate action. And in response to all of this pushback, and this started happening especially as you went to the late 80s, early 90s, you started to see corporate boards change. Change never happens voluntarily. Managers don't wake up one day and say, let's do the right thing. Change happens because they feel pressure. So you start to see boards become smaller over time, fewer insiders. Directors finally started to you know, get compensated with shares rather than just with cash. And more and more companies had a nominating committee though it was only a nominating committee in name because the CEO often gave them the names. But at least in theory, the CEO was no longer just handpicking the directors. It's good, right? So let's go back to Disney. Remember in 97, I showed you the Disney board? A rubber stamp for an imperial CEO. In 1997, Michael Eisner was at the peak of his glory. You know why? Because he'd had 12 years where he'd done really well for Disney. The earnings had gone up. The stock price had gone up. In fact, he was so powerful that in 1996, 
he boasted about the fact that about how he bought Cap City's ABC. He said he and Tom Murphy, who was the CEO, met outside some symposium they were at, and while they were outside, he just made Tom Murphy the offer of "I'll buy your company." And you know, he, was, he did this to show that he could think on his feet. He didn't need bankers. He didn't man. He didn't need anybody else. Well, let's move forward. That Cap City's acquisition kind of blew up in Disney's face. And the five or six years after, between 98 and 2002 in particular, Disney saw its stock price collapse, its earnings start to come under pressure. And remember, Michael Eisner's never been nice to you. You're Disney shareholders, he's never been nice to you. But you were okay with it as long as he was doing well for you. And now that he's doing badly, you notice that he's just a mean guy who's doing badly. You're getting pissed off and more pissed off. So each year, Disney would move its annual meetings to smaller and smaller forums, hoping that fewer people would show up. I was convinced that if this trend line continued, at, point, at some point in time, Disney's next annual meeting would be in a restroom in Kansas City, <laughs> where only two people could fit in the room, and Eisner would be one of them. And the other one would be handpicked. But basically, people were getting pissed off. And you could see this start to rise in the, in the percentage of no votes. Still, you weren't getting to 50% in an annual meeting. In 2003, two of the directors who were on that board that I showed you, Stanley Gold and Roy Disney, resigned. What was interesting about Roy Disney is he actually worked for Disney. He was a, he was a head of a, of a division. And they resigned saying, Eisner will not listen to the board. Why they found this out in 2003, I don't know. But it's a sign that they felt, so basically he never listened, but now they felt Power, empowered enough to say, hey, we're resigning. And in 2004, the final blow came. Comcast announced perhaps the most insulting takeover bid in history. Normally when you try to take over a company, what do you do? You take the stock price and you offer a premium, right? You know what Comcast did? They took the stock price and offered a discount. <laughs> it was never meant to succeed. It was just like, this is what we think of you, Disney. And you, Michael Eisner, your stockholders hate you so much, they would probably sell the stock at a discount just to get rid of you. The takeover obviously did not work, but the message had been delivered. And Eisner had to listen. So the first thing that happened was he decided that he could, should no longer be chairman of the board. In fact, he called it, oh, this is a terrible setup, as if somebody had forced it on him. Okay? So he t I think George Mitchell became the chair of the board. He said, we have too many insiders. So basically, he woke up to a reality that we all knew about. He said, well, I'm going to do something about it. And he did what companies do when they're in corporate governance trouble. He, he wrote a big corporate governance part of the annual report showing about how good they were at corporate governance and how much they listened. He thought we'd stave off the problem. In fact, here's uh, the changes he announced. He said, we're going to make ourselves more responsive to shareholders and we're going to create nominating committees. We're going, to, we're going to do everything right. So they probably had three corporate governance experts come in and say, this is what you should do. The problem was it was too late. People were, that critical mass had come and gone. In fact, in 2005, Eisner resigned. Really, he was, you know, the, the, his rubber stamp board, think of how bad things have to be. When your rubber stamp board comes and says, hey, Mike, you've got to leave. I think his personal attorney was gone finally. Yeah. He left, and a new CEO came in. The dawn of a new age, Bob Iger came in. He was the anti-Eisner. A man without an ego, kind of self-effacing, willing to listen to shareholders. You're saying, this is good. The board he created was more independent. Everything. This story looks like it's going to have a happy ending, right? In fact, by 2009 or 2010, Disney was on top of those corporate governance rankings. It was considered a company with some of the best corporate governance among entertainment companies. Still, the happy story continues. In fact, in 2011, I'll make the story even happier. Iger announced on his own that it was unhealthy for a company to have a CEO for too long, that he planned to step down in 2015. He wanted to give the board time to find you know, somebody to replace him. If this story had ended here, it'd be like a Disney movie. <laughs> yeah. 
princess finds a prince, they move off, they you know, ride off into the sunset or drive off in a Ferrari or whatever version of the movie you're looking at. No? Here's where the board stepped in and behaved in its usual dysfunctional form. I, Iger says, look, you know, I want to re, re, you know, move on in 2015, find a successor. The first thing the board does was it made him chairman of the board. And next thing they did was they went to Iger and said, you cannot leave. You're far too critical to Disney's success. You know what Ju Julius Caesar, the Shakespeare version? He's offered the crown f first. What does he say? I'm not worthy of the crown. Take it away. He's offered the crown a second. And I'm not worthy of the crown. Still take it away. He's offered it a third time. Said, you know what? It fits. Put it on. <laughs> So first time they told Iger, you're too important. Said, no, 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 nobody's that important. This is a big company, a lot of very. Second time, oh, no, nobody. Third time, you know what? You're right. So in 2014, Iger says he's changed his mind because the board induced him to change his mind that he was going to stay on as CEO. Now remember, when he announced that he was leaving in 2015, there was a whole layer of managers below who were getting ready to move up the ranks. When he announced he was, he was, going, to, he was going to stay on, guess what happened? His self-picked successor said, I'm not going to hang around here. In fact, the logical next names, you know, which included Tom Staggs and a couple of other people said, hey, I'm moving on. I can't wait around for you. His decision left a vacuum at Disney. And in 2018, of course, they bought Fox. Now, Iger is really stuck. There's nobody in the second layer you can point to and say, obvious CEO. Now you've made this huge acquisition, so guess what the pressure is going to be? You made this big acquisition, you got to make this work. I mean, I think he's created a management problem at Disney. And I blame the board for it. By pushing him into it, they've, in a sense, destroyed the chance of having a successor. And it still percolates through the organization. Some of the best names in Disney often tend to move on because they're looking at the future saying, I'm never going to make it to the top here. So what's a lesson I would draw from this? When Iger came in, he was a responsive CEO. He did the right thing. I'm convinced that you need some term limits for CEOs as well, that the longer you stay on a CEO, the more those corporate governance problems build up that board starts to become more of a rubber stamp board. Okay. I'm not sure how you institute it, but I, I think at some point in time, it's, you know, managers need to move on. Because if you stay on, you get the continuity. But you also get this corporate governance power kind of all concentrated at the top. Yeah. So uh, you said that he would be using software. On that, let's say Disney is a company where the market very seldom reacts to who the top manager is because they're convinced the manager doesn't even matter that much in the short term. If you had something catastrophic happen to Iger, I'm not wishing this on him, then we'll find out. But really, the, all these were small changes in a very big company. Right? They, the market reacted much more to the Fox acquisition than it did in 2015 because it wasn't even a big news story. It was actually a very small news story buried in another news story. Not just the, the news that you yeah. stay in as CEO, but in terms of performance. You also oh, you can, I mean, we'll be seeing 10 years of stock price. It has had its ups and its downs, and especially the last three years have been a struggle because the world is changing around Disney, right? Netflix is, is coming in. And you can see how Disney is positioning itself. I'm not, see, I'm not even saying that what Iger has done at the company is bad. That's the judgment we've got to still make. I'm saying he has too much power right now. And he has too much power, and there is nobody second in line, and he has only he has only himself to blame for where they are today. Is there any evidence that this is bad for the company? That you have a CEO, not necessarily, but power left unchecked. We know always lends itself to Jack Welch was a great CEO until he wasn't, right? I think, and this is just my cynical side. If you you know what what's the saying? Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think the same thing applies. CEOs are human beings. They have their strong points and their weak points. You know why you need a strong board? Is when you are on your weak side, you need a board that will stop you. Okay? And everybody has a weak side. You are, and I think you see this play out with the big tech companies as well. 
Google is not a corporate democracy. It's a dictatorship with Bryn and Page at the top. <coughs> Facebook is definitely not a democracy. And as long as Zuckerberg was viewed as this great young manager, we all were okay with it. Now people are saying, how come he's not listening to us? Because he has his blind spots as well, and without a board kind of telling him, this is your blind spot, you need to be aware of it. All CEOs have blind spots. You don't even need to change the management. You just need to keep them restrained when they start to wander off the reservation. So you're saying, well, if you can't do this, why don't we have legislation that legislates at every company of good corporate governance? That was the Dodd-Frank. Original objective of the Dodd-Frank is we're going to legislate good corporate governance. Is it possible to legislate sensible voter choice or informed voter choice? This is something in, in principle we all agree. We need good corporate governance. But it's very difficult to legislate because in legislation what you end up with are check boxes. And that's what Dodd-Frank is. It's 1,100 pages of rules about boards. And when Dodd-Frank was passed, people said, well, this is it. We now will have good corporate governance. Well, I don't think boards today are any more effective than they were 20 years ago. They're on the face of it more independent. Why? Because the law requires it. But it's almost like every board of directors has two lawyers sitting in with the board now, making sure that they get the checkbox right, because it's become checkbox corporate governance. And I think we've done a disservice to corporate governance by making it about rules and meeting requirements, rather than asking the question, is this a board that asks tough questions of management, keep them going. So when you look at your company, I want you to do all the surface level numbers. What's a corporate governance score? Does it meet all the criteria for independence? But then I want you to ask the tougher question. Has this board shown any evidence of being willing to push back against management when they're doing things that should not be done? So that's a tougher test, and that requires that it come from below, right? Until, let's put it this way. How do you get a good democracy? You can't legislate a good democracy. You need voters who essentially do their jobs. Same thing applies here. As long as shareholders say, hey, you know what? I don't want to really worry about this corporate governance stuff. It's too much work for me. You're going to get bad corporate governance at the top. So ultimately, the answer lies in us as stockholders. If we don't care, it's not going to happen. Now the question is, you know, if you have better corporate governance, does it pay off? Well, I mean, if you, there, there, there are a few studies that have come out in the last 15 years that link how good, they're based on those corporate governance scores. So that's a limit, that the stronger the corporate governance in a company, the better it's priced, usually in the form of higher price earnings ratios, higher multiples. Very, it's weak evidence because there are so many other things that you don't control for. But good corporate governance seems to go with higher pricing. Across countries, the evidence is stronger. When you classify countries based on corporate governance, the countries where you see stocks trading at the lowest multiples of earnings tend to be the countries with the weakest corporate governance. But there again, you have exceptions. Chinese stocks trade at 35 times earnings. So if you ask me if, I, if we do the right thing and we have good corporate governance, does it mean stock prices will go up? Unfortunately, the evidence suggests they will, but I wouldn't put my money behind it, bet on it, because it's, the relationship is pretty weak. Okay. I'll give you my post, uh, the poster for corporate governance. And this is actually one of the data posts that I did at the start of this year. I actually write posts on what I see in the data, because I collect every publicly traded company. And one of the data posts, I think it's data post six, I looked at what percentage of companies globally have trouble making the hurdle rate. I mentioned this, I think, in the last week. 60%. If 60% of companies are having trouble taking projects that make the hurdle rate, we're desperately in need of good corporate governance. Because many of these companies have been doing the same stupid thing over and over again, and the same management continues to run the company. Now, when you talk about lenders again, let's think about how that process played out. So you had Nabisco happen in 1988. And until then, corporate bonds had zero clauses, nothing, no protection at all. Now think about what it is about the Nabisco you know, case that hurt you as a bondholder. What was it that caused it? You lent money to Nabisco thinking it was a safe firm, and it was when you lent it. Then they went out and did this leverage buyout where they multiplied the debt tenfold, making them a riskier firm, and what did I not let you do? 
reset the interest rate. Because if I would let you reset the interest rate based on how risky they were, you would have been protected. So post Nabisco, here's what you started to see in an increasing number of corporate bonds. They became puttable. You're saying, what the heck does it mean? There were clauses put into corporate bonds that says, if there's a leverage buyout in this company, you can put the bond back to the company and get your face value back. If you'd been a Nabisco bondholder with a put clause, you'd have gone back to Nabisco and said, guys, you changed the rules of the game. Give me my $1,000 back. You would not have been hurt. In fact, Merrill Lynch in the 1980s created bonds called rating-sensitive bonds. You're saying, what are those? The coupon rate on the bond was tied to what your bond rating was. So if you're double A rated, the coupon rate would be 5%. But if you made yourself a double B rated bond, the coupon rate would jump to 12%. Again, you'd have been made whole again. Too late to fix the Nabisco bondholders, but at least the bond market learned and moved on. You think, what about you know, companies that lie to market? They will never go away. Again, you can't legislate this because you know, the companies are going to push, you know, push the rules. And when the truth comes out, as it eventually was, the stock price drops. But the worst problem is it stays low. Because after that, who's going to believe you? That's why when you have a big corporate scandal, especially if it's an accounting scandal, you almost always have to have a cleaning out of the management. Because it's the same CEO in place, there's nothing you say that I'm ever going to believe again. So when we think about market problems, you're right, markets screw up. But at least, markets, unlike elites, have no ego. You can have an 85% drop, drop in the stock price in 15 minutes. So that's an advantage. When markets make mistakes, the pain is huge, but it is quick. And at least you get a chance to move on. And finally, on society, costs that consistently walk to the edge are risking it. Right? Example I like to use is Valium, pharmaceutical, Canadian pharmaceutical company that was taken over by an activist investor. Bill Ackman was one of the lead investors in the company. And the CFO and the CEO of the company were very driven by you know, what they call financial metrics and value creation. In fact, they gave a bad name to value maximization because of how they did it. And if you're a drug company, the way you maximize value is you take drugs. In fact, the, this was a Valiant rule book, is they would buy drugs that were already out there that um, had six to seven years left in the patent, where the company holding the drug had not done anything with the pricing for a while. And usually these were drugs that treated relatively few people, so small parts of the population. And then they would get the drug, and they would push up the price and get much higher margins. From a financial perspective, you're saying, what's wrong with that? It's supposed to maximize value. They were, you know, they were following the rule book of increasing earnings. The only problem is by doing this, some of the people with that disease you were trying to do could no longer afford the drug. And this process kind of happened. They were one of the most highly touted pharmaceutical stocks for about four or five years as the stock price climbed until things started to unravel. And if you're interested in why they started to unravel, it was one that they were, they were working with pharmacies to cook the, because in a sense, especially with the US healthcare, you got to get insurance companies to pay these higher prices, and they'd worked out this very elaborate sham pharmaceutical, uh, you know, an online pharmacy system that allowed them to get around the rules. And once that blew up, then the rest of the, the, the pieces started to fall in as well. The company stock price was around 200, dropped to about 25. And they, they fired the old CEO saying it's the CEO's fault. In fact, he got sick and he went to the hospital. They fired him while he was you know, in the hospital. They fired the CFO. They hired a new CEO and new CFOs that were fresh late. But the rest of the management team, and it turned out that they'd, that they'd poisoned the world so much that they were unable to function as a pharmaceutical company. In what sense? Pharmaceutical company, you need an R&D department. You need scientists. Well, and it turned out that the name was so contaminated because of what they'd done that they had trouble keeping their scscientists, keeping their managers. And they had trouble with it because now they became a political target as well. So a politician said, you can't buy any drugs from that company. It's an outlaw company. For two years, the stock price stayed. It dropped about 11, 12 in fact, I wrote three blog posts as they went down in price on what happens when, you're, when you contaminate your name so much that it hurts your business. Eventually, 
You know what they had to do? They had to change their name. They went from Valiant to Bausch. One of their divisions was Bausch and Long. They decided that as long as they were called Valiant, they could not survive. That's a case study of what happens when you decide. You know. In fact, the extreme case of this you know, faulty, what I call, you know, it's really not value max, short-term earnings maximization, is this dysfunctional, crazy guy called Martin Tritelli. Do you believe him? Yeah. One of the things I've been trying to live down is in what he do, does these extended rants. If you ever get a chance, go on YouTube of rants, because he's the guy who buys drugs and he'd raise the price to 15000 In one of the rants, he said that he'd learned his corporate finance by watching my videos. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 you learned all the wrong things. You do what video did you watch? You know? But in a sense, it's an extreme version of, hey, maximizing value must mean maximizing earnings. Maximizing earnings must mean I can buy this drug which treats only 5,000 people and charge 50000 for the drug because that's maximizing earnings. Maximum value is a, is a long-term concept. If you're running a going concern, especially if it's a pharmaceutical company, increasing earnings this year by doing this is actually ruining your value. But I think people say, well, my higher earnings that must mean higher value. But ultimately, it catches up with you. And I think if we want companies to be socially responsible, we've got to make it in their financial best interest to be so. And you know how this will happen? If we as customers put our money where our mouth is. You know what? We like to talk about social responsibility, but when it comes to our own actions, whether as customers or investors, we look the other way. As long as that's true, all this will stay talk. So the next time you have the talk, turn to corporate social responsibility. Hey, this, it's completely compatible with corporate finance objectives if people care enough to actually act on the basis of what they're telling you matters. So if I bring together all of these different players, you manage this overreach, then you get activist investors, you get hostile takeovers. You rip off lenders, you, know, you essentially run the risk of, you know, of being Nabisco, basically. They, they fix their, their bonds, they try to do it better. You lie to markets, the truth eventually comes out, your price drops, it stays down. And finally, you start to create social costs all over. It's going to show up in your numbers. But more so, and this is what makes it unfair, more so in certain businesses than others. I remember when the Gap had its uh, issue with underage labor in Asia, and they had to very quickly react. You know why? Because the Gap has customers who actually were reading those news stories. It was a 60 Minutes episode, and I think their sales in stores dropped 7% of the week after. So they have to be socially responsible. Walmart has the same issue. You might not see it in your numbers. It's going to be much more difficult to convince Walmart. And that's why when we talk about corporate social responsibility and corporate sustainability and how it shows up in value, there's going to be no one metric that's going to cut across. Because some sectors, it's going to be easier to get companies to be socially responsible because the customers and investors in that sector are more receptive to this argument. Other sectors, people will talk about it, but then they'll move on and do whatever they did before. So I, as I said, I, you know where I stand. And I'll kind of summarize it in the next page. And I don't want you to pick something for me right now. But when you get a chance, I want you to think about all of the different things you said. And pick for yourself what you think the end game for a company is. And no cheating, no having four objectives. You can have one objective and multiple constraints. And you can decide what the objective and what the constraint should be. But think through what that objective should be. Because as I said, everything else a company does will be driven by that objective. So here's how I view the objective in corporate finance. If you're one of those rare companies that operates in markets which are reasonably efficient, and lenders in society figure out ways to protect themselves, society by passing laws and restricting things you can do, and lenders by putting protection, then go out and maximize stock price. The, the side costs are going to be relatively small. If you're in a market where you're publicly traded firms, the market's not that efficient. Investors do crazy things, 66 million people walking around thinking Elvis is still alive. And lenders are not protected that well, then I want you to focus on maximizing the value of your business because ripping off your lenders is not a great way to create value overall. 
And if you're a publicly traded firm where investors are, f are bondholders are fully protected, then again, you can maximize stockholder wealth, not stock price, because that's. And if you're a private company, you're saying, well, there's no stock price. Of course there's not. You still have to make a decision. Do I want to make, make my private company the most valuable company I can? And there again, whether lenders are protected or not can come into play. So if you put me in Poland, in a publicly traded company, and the CFO CEO says, well, what should we do in this company? Should we go out and maximize stock price? Because that's what I read in my corporate finance textbook. Because remember, much of corporate finance has been spread around the world from those original corporate finance books that were written in the US in the 60s and the 70s. I won't tell them you're crazy. Because the Polish stock market is not the most liquid market in the world. I don't know what you could do to increase the stock price, but if you focus on the stock price, you can do some very dysfunctional things. So the objective you might pick in an emerging market with a liquid, you know, with a liquid investments, and lenders who don't protect themselves might be very different than the objective you pick in a liquid market that you think is also reasonably efficient. There's no getting away from that market efficiency part. It's always going to be under, because what you think about markets and how they set prices is going to drive what your end game is going to be. So I know we have only five minutes left, but I'm going to set up the discussion for next week. Next week, we're going to get into what I call the meat and potatoes part of corporate finance. So if you were liking this fuzzy stuff, saying this is good, I'm no, this is, you know, I, I am okay, this is like my strategy class, <laughs> wave it goodbye, right? It's in the rear view mirror, because next week we're going to talk about coming up with a hurdle rate. And we're going to talk about, don't, don't put your stuff away, I have four minutes left, come on. Yeah? I can get a lot done in four minutes. We're going to talk about hurdle rates and how hurdle rates should reflect the riskiness of your investment. You say, what the heck is a hurdle rate? Every time you make an investment, the hurdle rate is what you need to make for that investment to be a good investment. So I'm at least going to set up what I'm going to try to do next week. For a hurdle rate, I'm going to start with a riskless rate. Why? Because at the if you can make something guaranteed, you need to make something more. And I'm going to try to come up with a risk premium that reflects the risk of the investments you've taken. So the entire focus for the next two or three sessions is going to be, how do we measure the risk in an investment? Because right now, we've just left it as this fuzzy word. And second, how do we convert that risk into a hurdle rate? Because it's not just enough for me to tell you riskier investments need higher hurdle rates. I need to tell you how to measure risk and bring it into a hurdle rate. It should be 13% or 15%. Because we need numbers. We can't just have fuzzy high hurdle rates, low hurdle rates. So next session when we start off, I'm going to start off by defining and measuring risk. And we're going to go through the standard risk and return model in finance in a very different way. You know, the standard risk and return model in finance is the one you saw in your foundations class, the cap -AM. But you're going to see a very different def der 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 derivation of the cap -M. I'm not going to use portfolio theory and you know, indifference curves. I'm going to give you an intuitive derivation of the cap -M because to me it's a tool. It's not the end game. And I'm going to use that as a way of thinking about risk and coming up with a measure of risk. And then we're going to be off to the races on how to measure risk-free rates, risk premiums, all the other numbers that we need. So I will see you on Monday and have a good weekend. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Next Wednesday. We have no class on Monday. Uh, so, last class you mentioned something about figuring out the relationship of board directors in the 14th death. Yep. Uh, but I didn't get that correct. What, what is the, the 14 death? I think you mentioned. 14 death is an OCC filing where you have to reveal who's on the board and what their conflict of interest are. So exactly. You go the to the OCC website and you type in your company, you see all the filings they make. Yeah. You're looking for It's called DF14 or 14 death. DF14. So yeah. oh, thank you. And only for US companies. Only for US companies. Question for you. So I was researching the company and their board is rated really well in terms of ISS, but. And you say about trying to figure out if they've really asked that further question, if they've ever really pushed back. You're going to be looking at new stories on something the company okay. wanted. Because you're looking for new stories on some big action that the company is planning to take, where you might not even see the specific, but they pull back. Because when they pull back, it's usually because the board, the board push has back. pushed back because they've got that new thing. Sometimes it's explicit. You see the Wall Street Journal okay. have a story. So it's 
most companies will find nothing, which is consistent with the notion that you have these nice independent boards, but they're really doing nothing. But okay. I would put it around, take it around a big action that the company, so the company's done an acquisition, look to see whether any board member, member even spoke up. Look to see if the board has even been active in the process. Well, they've like publicly spoken out. And often we see news stories, we give you evidence to the contrary, which is we see an acquisition, we have two bidders for the company, one is offering a higher price, and they pick the lower price. Point. The board has to board up. And the question is, why would you do that? Because managers felt more comfortable with the lower price bidder. So, unfortunately, as stories you're going to find will often push against the fact that this looks like an effective board, but it's not actually. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Hi, sir. Uh, I didn't fully understand the difference between the two objectives of uh, maximizing stock price. Stock, well, maximizing firm value and maximizing shareholder wealth. Well, you can maximize shareholder wealth by ripping off your bondholders, right? So if you, let's say you have a company which is worth 100, equity is worth 60, lenders are worth 40. Right? They do a, something like the Nabisco test. Okay. The, the 40 becomes 27 because they ripped off the bondholders. Okay. The 60 becomes 68. So the equity, the, so the stockholder wealth went up, but it went up because you ripped, so the overall company went from 100 to 91, but equity investors are now better off because they stole enough money from the lenders to cover it. Okay, so I didn't realize we were including debt in that. Firm value is always value. equity plus debt. If you look at the financial balance sheet, firm okay. value is debt plus equity. Right? Okay. It's always the entire value of the business. Got it. So you can make your business less valuable and your equity value equity more valuable by ripping off your bondholders. Got it. It's effectively in a leverage bar. There's no value created, right? It's value transfer. Right. Nabisco Equity investors were delirious with joy. They made a ton of money. Okay. But Nabisco bondholders. I got you. Right? So that's really the contrast between firm and equity. That makes sense. And the contrast between equity value and equity stock price is equity value goes to 68. If you're in an efficient market, your stock price would also go up. But if you're not in an efficient market, the stock price can do its own thing. It can go up, it can go down, it can do strange things. So focusing on stock prices, you're getting even more specific. I'm not just going to maximize equity value, I'm going to maximize the stock price. So at each level, you are making assumptions. The first level, when you go from firm value to stockholder wealth, you're assuming lenders are well protected. You can't Got rip it. them off. To go from stockholder wealth to stock prices, you're assuming markets are efficient. Right. So each time you lose one of that, the faith in one of those, you, you're moving back up the ladder. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I yeah. have a question uh, with regards to the cost of governance, uh, mm -hmm. you know, part that you're talking about. You spoke about how, like, the more independent the direct directors are, the better view. No, I didn't say that. I said independence is easy. Right. It's a technical requirement. Independence just means I don't know this guy, I've never done this. Effectiveness is a very different Question. But then how do you like uh, how do you measure that? That's that's the subjective part. You the basically you're looking to see whether you're looking at news stories, right? right. And ninety five percent of the time what are you gonna find? Nothing. What does that tell you? That yeah. most boards are not effective, right? Okay. When boards act up, it's news. Right? So it'll take the form of stopping a CEO, slowing them down, an acquisition that gets pulled off the table. Right. And so when boards act up, you will hear about it because it becomes news. Why? Because it's so unusual. Right. So what you're checking is, is there anything in the news stories? It used to be LexisNexis, but now on Google search, type in the name of your company, you know, look for the last two years. So if you, and even if you consider like a company like Berkshire Hathaway, now the board is completely- Come on, like Berkshire Hathaway is a, is, 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 um, it's a it, the board has not been what makes Berkshire Hathaway, right? It's yeah. a Warren Buffett company. If you think that for a moment, I mean, this is actually going to be talked about authority figure. Right. Can you imagine sitting on the Berkshire board and Warren Buffett gets up and says, we're going to buy XYZ company. Is there going to be a single person in the room who's going but to push that? Berkshire people. It's not just the Berkshire people, it's Warren Buffett. It's a legend, right? I mean, my guess is it, it's not even his fault. I think it'll be, he, it'd be impossible for him to create a board that'll actually push back. But then yeah. Jack Welch in his time would have been no, Jack Welch went out by design and created a board that, that was in his image. He was more, I mean, unlike Buffett, he didn't even ask. He told the board. I mean, he, you know, he, it, it's his personality. He's like a, you know, a boxer. If you ever watch Tom, the, everything is, is aggressive. You kind of even ask him a question. Right. And 
And it said, uh, the, the legend is that there wasn't a single board meeting at GE where there was a single board of nobles. And that tells you something about intimidation and uh, Berkshire 